Good evening, Papua New Guinea, and welcome to Football First. And as you can tell, I have grown. I am the same height as Marco Vendetti. In fact, good evening to you, nice Marco. Nice meeting you again. Yes, it, as always, it's just fantastic. Now, Marco, big news in the world of football this week. Uh, the government has made clear their commitment of 20 million in preparation for the World Cup. Well, I think I need to step in to talk about that because uh, that's I, I 20 million might tinas. Have to and it'll just disappoint can I? The whole bunch of people out there. Can that I? Actually Let me come in. Anymore. Let me come in again. Good to see you again. It Good is as again. always. Good to see. You. So, just uh, getting straight into it, uh, government reiterates commitment uh, for the World Cup. Uh, fantastic news, I think, for a lot of people out there. What were your thoughts uh, when you well, it's read tw the article? 20 million kina thoughts. I mean, that's really good news. And uh, but there is, there is one thing I don't doubt is the, the government of Papua New Guinea takes sports seriously. We have seen this uh, throughout the Pacific game, which was a much more complicated uh, event to stage and organize. So I don't see why they wouldn't do the same for something much smaller. But the beauty of it, that is going to have a much wider audience. So the formula is right there. And now knowing, hearing about the government and actually committing uh, with, a, with a specific number gives a little bit of relief to uh, a society uh, that he was getting a little bit worried and a little bit concerned about uh, the speed of the process. But all good news. Well, uh, speaking of good news, in fact, um, the great thing about that is uh, preparations can now go full steam ahead. Mm. In fact, uh, let's just take a look at what the Minister for Sport, the Honorable Justin Chichenko, had to say in a recent interview. With the 20 million kina that the government's putting, with the 10 million from FIFA, we are upgrading all our facilities to an international level where we will be able to host and play any international game into the future as well for soccer, rugby, uh, league, what have you. Um, so it's giving us that level of um, international uh, accreditation uh, that we haven't had before for these particular um, fields and facilities. So I would hope by uh, October this year that 99% uh, of all the facilities are completed and ready uh, for the FIFA World Cup. Um, we are moving full steam ahead. Uh, Marco, fantastic news uh, made by the Minister for Sport, uh, Justin Chichenko. Your thoughts when you uh, first heard? Well, look, uh, at the end of the day, we're talking about uh, four venues for 16 teams. I think that's, that's the formula. Uh, three, they're pretty much done. Uh, one maybe is still under construction to a certain extent. So that means that you have to just build a prototype. So that's not a lot of effort. The other thing that is missing, I think, is the uh, training ground. But it's like, I'm from Rome, okay? So we have the Colosseum. This is where the gladiators used to fight and all of that. And they, we used to also have a small little training ground just next to it. You know, 2,000 years after, everybody talks about the Colosseum, not the training ground. So that's what is missing, perhaps. And uh, I think they, FIFA requires about uh, 14 or 15 of 14, those. Yep. So I think that's a challenge at the moment, but it's a small challenge. Now. Of those 20 million that the, the minister uh, was talking about, he also talked about the 10 million will come from FIFA. Obviously, it will be interesting to know how that money will be actually released and, and dis dispersed. So uh, that will be uh, the challenge. I suppose that all that money won't come all at once. Uh, but so uh, it is a great news. And uh, we're looking forward, we'll, we'll be monitoring it. But uh, like in any event worldwide, there is always a certain amount of skepticism uh, is inevitable. Okay, but uh, Papua New Guinea is us usually surprised a lot of people. Has surprised me <laughs> during the Pacific Games. <laughs> Pleasantly surprised. Be because you you have to admit that um, at at one stage the president for PNG football did come under fire from members of the public, uh, raising their concern about uh, the fact that a lot of people thought that th the bid process was made perhaps prematurely. Right. Do you feel it was done so? Well, I think a bidding process is always uh, premature in the sense that you never know if a country is ready to host such a big event until you actually have hosted. And I think that happened during the Pacific Games and it will happen one more time <laughs> during the FIFA World Cup. It's just the nature of the beast. You, d you don't know if you're ready. But you j it's, a, it's a gamble. And in that sense, I do understand the administration that they wanted to gamble on something as important as a world uh, stage uh, event as, uh, as the FIFA World Cup. So 
hats off. I mean, I think that's the right thing to do. Uh, will Papua New Guinea be ready? As we know, it's going to be ready probably two days before the opening. Uh, and you will want to see per perhaps a better planning, a better organization for the future. But so, uh, yeah, as long as you be ready two days before the, <laughs> the event, we will be happy. So now the government is taking a little bit more of a lead into that. That reassures skepticism, gives confidence that this will go ahead. It's not over. FIFA hasn't really said it's okay. I think they came here uh, a week ago. Now they will be back again. And FIFA is a serious organization despite the corruptions and the scandals that we, we heard in the past. They will come back and they will deliver. But I am absolutely confident that Papua New Guinea will not let this opportunity uh, slip out of his fingers. Do you think they would? I have no comments for that considering the fact that I was born in this country. <laughs> However, uh, coming up after the break, uh, we will talk about something that I am far more familiar with in terms of the World Cup because uh, I think you've been to, uh, you've seen very high level matches uh, throughout Absolutely. your entire life. Yeah, well, I was in Italy during the World Cup in Italy. I was in the United States during the, the World Cup there, so I, I have a fair amount of experience, yeah. <sighs> and that's all I can say. <laughs> well, coming up after the break, uh, we'll take a look at the results from the Telecom and National Soccer League. Stay with us. Running now. Kicked it through. Gabinyaba. Gabinyaba might score. Hikari United beat Welgris Morobe United two goals to one at the Sir Ignace's Kelaga Stadium. The Telecom National Soccer League champions, 13 game winning streak continued with this upset to Morobe Welgris at home in front of a near 10,000 fans. As rain threatened to pour, both teams looked evenly matched in the first five minutes. Against the backdrop of heavy cheers by the home crowd, Morobe Welgris came up with the first points. In the 23rd minute, Sammy Campbell missed a crossball into the box for Biken Yanom, who volleyed past Hikari United goalkeeper Ismail Pole. The 10,000 fans go crazy. The game continued with Hikari chasing Welgris. After 19 minutes of intense football, in the dying minutes of the first half, Hikari draw level with Korea Kupaiga scored from Emmanuel Simon pass. After a sloppy Welgris defense, the break at halftime was silent, fans sensing that Hikari United was on a comeback. In the second half, the tussle continued midway through and the second handball by Hikari goalkeeper Ismail Pole gave a free kick but Welgris failed to capitalize. In the 64th minute, Hikari United's Barry Monsale scored the finisher ensuring Hikari United won 2-0 at full time. Big victory for Lay City. I won't say it was the best performance that we've Over in Port Moresby, Lay City dwellers have secured their third win in the finals competition of the Telecom National Soccer League, trashing PKA Rapatona 5 0 at the Bissini Precinct. First goal came from dwellers captain Raymond Gunaba to see them take the lead. Moves to his left hand side, takes a shot. Goal! Minutes after, Nigel Debinaba placed one behind Rapatona keeper John Bai from a sneaky pass from Gunaba. Debinaba might score! The third goal saw Debinyaba got his second of the match, gently placing it behind the net. Teasing play! Teasing wonder! Gunemba furthered their lead a minute after with a massive strike into the net. Another chance now for Lay City. Gunemba! Gunemba takes it! Dwellers fifth and final goal of the match occurred from a ball handling error by Rapatona goalkeeper John Bai. Michael Foster's penalty kick slipped through the hands of John Bai to see Obed Bika embarrassing Rapatona goalkeeper with a simple tap-in goal from behind. Thanks, Shane. Now, we have here tonight what we would like to tactically, strategically position ourselves in calling the whiteboard. The whiteboard. Very original name. Loves it. Thank you. We, I actually went on the internet and <laughs> thought of, I saw a million things and it's decided that was... It's functional. It works. It works. Yeah. Now, tonight, of course, Marco, we are talking about uh, Saturday's Podmosi based match, uh, which was between Lay City dwellers in yellow yep. and Rapatona in red. They pull Rapatona in red. Yeah. Yeah, they got a beating. But it will be interesting to look at the goals and see what 
sort of mistakes we, they made, according to us, obviously, and, and to yourself as well. So it would be interesting to look at it. Yeah. Well, there was one particular player that you were very, very interested in, um, Lay City's number seven, Raymond yeah, Gunemba. Gunemba, impressive, impressive yeah. guy. Really fast, clear-minded, so really like this guy. Now, in fact, let's just take a look at uh, how the first goal came about. You yeah. said that he actually um, took a shot from the left-hand side. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to say, but this was the mistake of the goalkeeper, and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, when you have a forward that makes that sort of movement, that goes from the right to the left, at the edge of the box, he's avoiding, he's avoiding the defender. He's not going to go on a one-to-one -one with the defender. He's just making a move, a diagonal, from the right to the left. 80% of the time, if he's going to shoot, he will be shooting diagonally. Okay. That's, that's a rule of the game. It's always, it always happens. When you make a movement from the, from the right to the left, you will be shooting diagonally. You will not be shooting straight. Most of the time, it just it comes with it. It's, it's, it's a dynamic thing. So the goalkeeper should have been staying a few meters ahead, not standing on the line like he did. He should have been standing here and knowing that 80% of the time that shot would be it would coming have gone for across the far post on the other side. Because it was not a really impressive shot. It was a decent shot from far away at the edge of the box. He had plenty of time to see that ball. The ball kept on, kept on coming, kept on coming, and he just missed it. So for me, that was a mistake of the goalkeeper. Not now that the, the second goal also came about from uh, Raymond, and he set up uh, Nigel Gabinyaba with a through ball, who there yeah. and then was able to step past the goalkeeper yeah. and score. It was a beautiful goal, it was a beautiful yeah. pass, cut through the defence, but I think the mistake was way before. The mistake was here, right in the middle of the midfield, okay? They, were, they lost the ball, really an easy ball, they just lost control of it and they gave it back to the opponents. But the problem was that the midfielder were here and the defenders were here and there was absolutely nothing in the middle. They were about 10, 15, maybe 20 meters, no man's land. And you cannot do that in football. The reason why you want to avoid a one-to-one -one situation, okay? A defender has a lot of trouble on a one-to-one. -one. Do you feel that there was still far too much space between the Rapatona defense and their own midfield, which was which, yes. which had pushed up too much. Too much. I think they s the, the midfield made a, made a mistake of losing the ball so stupidly, let's say, but also the, the defense was just looking from the distance, whereas in football, you need to have the three lines of defend, midfielder, and attack very close to each other. If you look playing Barcelona, it's very difficult even to identify the lines because they're so close to each other. And to be that close means that you have to run more and uh, that's the tricky thing you need to be in a perfect shape to play that sort of game where the three lines of defense midfield and attack are very close to each other because you can help each other so if you have lost the ball here the midfielder even stupidly if the defense was here they would have saved that ball and they would have left the three attack uh, attacks in in an offside position so the defender should have called the line up instead of just waiting down here and that's what happened they went on a one-to-one -one situation and then he made a beautiful pass that cut through the defense. He came around and he scored a goal. 2 nil in the first half. 2 nil in the first half. Three more goals were scored in the, in the second half. Yes. Uh, one of those, uh, goal number three, passed from the number seven. Yes. Raymond passed it to Nigel right inside the six yards box. Yes. He scored only a moment later they scored again. Now, you were impressed, but, well, I actually noticed something about that. Now, we're just, we're just going to shift the colors around a little bit and say that this is now Lay City's forward. And you had the Rapatona defense all over here. Now, there was actually only, only two players inside the, the Rapatona half at that That's point true. in time. That's true. What I noticed was when he had the ball, this is what happened. What was the mistake Rapatona made? What, what do you think? Because what I noticed was that they compressed three, of three defensive players to stop just one and the ball came in. There was a problem of position in the defense and I think, uh, sorry I forgot his name, it was number 15. It was often very uh, out of position. He was just wandering, uh, looking for his position in the pitch. And I think that a lot of, a lot of the dangers came on this side in the second half, on the left side. They, under they understood that the left flank had a weakness and uh, after the second and third goal, obviously, the, the morale of the team just went down the drain. And, they, and that's when 
when that's what happened when you might get four or five goals but I wanted to say something else I think that Rapatona knows how to play football he just doesn't know how to score goals in the first half they had two clear chances of scoring and the, the game started very equally between the two teams. Rapatona had two incredible chances. One of them, even my mother, I think, would have put that ball in. But it, it just didn't happen. And when you do, once you do that, the morale of the team, it just goes down. Because you feel like you're doing such a good job. You're producing good football. You have chances of scoring, but you don't do it. If I was going to ask you, at the end of the day, at the end of this whole discussion, what is the biggest lesson that we can learn from this? space. I think there was too much space that was given to the opposition. I think uh, too much time was given to the opposition and the opposition made use of the time that they had and the space that they were given. Well, coming up after the break we'll take a look at Lay City's uh, captain Raymond Gunemba. We had the privilege of having a chat with him last week and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Gunemba, one, two, three. Name me Raymond Gunemba, and you're watching Football First. And welcome back to Football First. Now, Marco, there was one particular player that did impress you over mm. the weekend, uh, Lay City's captain, uh, Raymond Gunemba. Yes, uh, it, I think it would be interesting to see, because he plays in a way very similar to Tommy Semi, uh, kind of same position. It would be interesting to see him back-to-back, uh, -back, you know, images of Tommy Semi and, and images of uh, Gunemba, because they play a similar uh, game. But at the end, Gunemba is so much more effective in front of the goal, and this is what makes a difference for, uh, for a forward, isn't it? You, you, you might have a lot of chances, but you know, the difference between a good forward is the one who once you have that chance. He has that clear mind, clear vision in front of the goal. He keeps his cold blood you know, in place and, and then puts the ball in, which We've seen sometimes uh, Tommy Semi being such a fantastic player, but in front of the goal, something, sometimes something happens there. So, very impressed with this, uh, with this player. Definitely has a future. Well, in fact, uh, let's just take a look at Raymond Gunemba. Gunemba. Gunemba again. Moves to his left-hand side, takes a shot. Goal! And a brilliant strike by the captain for Lay City Dwellers. Raymond Gunemba has been a hero countless times for both club and country. And his name has slowly become synonymous with all that epitomizes Moroban football. As captain of the Lay City Dwellers Football Club, Raymond has a key figure in the victory in the 2015 season of the Telecom National Soccer League. Fellow striker Nigel Davin Yaba has been a close companion of Gunemba on and off the pitch. Gunemba, one to it. Might chip it over. Both of us, like Nigel is my junior. We brought up together in one area. Same club, amateur club. So the way I play, Nigel, uh, coming from a softball family, he come res reside in our area. Then it switched from softball to uh, football. From there, he was following me like his role model. Every like the way I play and that he follows me up. Now he. Uh, with his discipline and commitment, now he's somebody. So, like, we play together from the local club up to NSL. We came to Ekari, then we go back together. I think it's God's will. So, we, so how we play, like, from the local club to NSL, so we know how, how we play. So, he knows where I move. I know where he move. And we like. To date, Raymond, as well as younger siblings Troy, Megan, and Jodo, are all members of the PNG national team in various divisions. I'm very proud of this. I think I'm um, true law, commitment law. Uh, my father and mother, 
Yes, they give all their life through soccer, starting when I was not born until when I was born, then all my brothers and sisters, they give their life through soccer. That's why uh, with, through soccer and uh, having the faith and trust in the Lord, right? that's why now the comeback of the blessing. Your uncle too is Raymond Nasser? Yes, Raymond Nasser, uh, Gidix Nasser, they are the famous uh, yeah, legend, Morobe, soccer stars. Very tight family that you have. Yes. <laughs> Being a former member of Hekari has given Raymond a lot of respect for his former club, but has also given him invaluable experience as he leads his side into the Champions League debut. Uh, like, play, um, they are the champion, so maybe in Pila I want to, um, so now me come back in the team to me. It's like me play against him all. Like, um, I want to beat them. My confidence and whatever uh, some things I learned from them, now I, with my boys, give them the strength and what, so really want to beat them. And he recognizes the quality of the opposition that the team will face. Like, um, now we are pulled, we already know our pool, like we are in pool of death. <laughs> you got Oakland City, uh, Amical and Solomon Warriors. Solomon Warriors is uh, so that's their first first time, but the two big guns from the Oceania and us. So like we go as newcomers and underdogs. A second title is still the aim for Lay City dwellers, and the faith that the team relies upon is very clearly shown on Gunemba's face. Like for my point of view, like. Uh, the team is good, but uh, like we, me plus a lot committed to the Lord. So with the discipline from all the players, commitment you know, towards the Lord, I think it, it will help us achieve the title again. In terms of the footballing opportunity that are available for women in the country, Gunemba had this to say. But now, like, you have the big two cities only, Mosby and Lay. So, it, like, the selectors, they just go into these two big cities and collect the players from there. So, if you have those NSL team uh, for the women, then, like, uh, small centers, they uh, make one NSL team and bring it to the competition, then you'll find some good talent in there. So, it's like, they should start the NSL, women's NSL. Whatever your dreams, like becoming a football star or what it will come to. Time once you believe in Lord, you trust him, you do to him, then dream and will become a good soccer player, a professional soccer player. That once you believe in God, you be in him. And then you commit to the training blue, then everything will and become be him like na thing thing do. Because the faith you have in Lord. It's now I'm I'm back you just want something you like Ilem. Remember, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Because, uh, but I mean that's what we as a coach is uh, what we actually like. Uh, <laughs> Welcome back to football. First, now finally. Um, I was able to have a chat with Fleming Seretsliv, the Danish uh, national coach for the for the PNG um, men's national team. Right, Marco, and I'm just going to cut straight to that, and uh, let's see what he had to say of the men's the senior men's national team's preparation for the OFC Nations Cup. Seretsliv feels that with the current competition showcased in the NSL, he has had a relatively easy task of selecting an able squad. Say almost uh, the full uh, national team because we have a couple of players uh, playing outside P and D that also might be uh, belonging to the team, but we'll see that later. It's hard for me to say because I don't know how uh, uh, Papua New Guinea has uh, 
been uh, playing before, but I have a certain structure that uh, I want uh, uh, our team to have. And uh, actually, for this structure, we have been working on this now in four trainings uh, in, in three days. Uh, and I think we have uh, achieved a bit during those uh, three days here. I'm very satisfied with the way uh, players are acting, with the way uh, they are training and so on. And uh, I'm, sh I'm sure we will uh, we'll be able to build a good team. Twelve players from Hikari make up the bulk of the selection, and the national coach believes that with the player understanding, it will also make it easier in terms of working together. Uh, I've, I've just been uh, watching, uh, first of all, the players' individual skills. But of course, it means something when, um, when players are used to, to play together. It absolutely makes it easier uh, for them to to make good, to make a good uh, performance because they know they know each other. So in this matter, of course, it counts. But first of all, I've been watching their their individual skills. When asked the contentious question of whether NSL leading scorer Koreko Paiga would be placed as a striker instead of a defender, Siritslev was coy in his remarks. No doubt about uh, this. Whether I'm, I will use him uh, as a striker or a second striker, uh, actually I haven't decided uh, yet because I know he also has some uh, very good uh, skills when it's, when it's about defending. And you might not be popular when you say it, but actually the teams with the best defense, they are always the teams on top of the, uh, of the tables. So you could say it's important that you have a, you have a strong defence and it gives confidence for the other players, for the midfield and for, for the attackers. Because many times it actually shows up that the teams... The national team will be travelling to the Solomon Islands by the end of March and Seritslev will use that time to assess the strengths of his squad before further trips to Korea in preparation for the OFC Nations Cup. To compete on higher level it takes much more matches than we are playing here at the moment but let's see um it's my feeling that uh, papua new guinea is developing uh, step by step i think png has a lot of talent for what i've seen individually i've seen some excellent players here they have the perfect body and the perfect they're great athletes uh, they just need help in understanding the game and understanding that Although they're very strong physically, individually, they can't win a game on their own. You need to be part of a team. So that's what I would be looking for. You know, in fact, Marco, I think you and I, uh, in a week from now, should pick our NSL 11. Oh, that's going to be a tough one. It will be. In fact, we're going to leave you here tonight with something. Let's just move away from all the hardcore serious stuff and we're gonna leave you tonight with some of the craziest things <laughs> that have happened in football like the fifth goal of the Rapatona <laughs> <laughs> good night Papua New Guinea I read it good night Buonasera Buonasera <laughs> <laughs>